Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we're going to take a look at the cannabis stock gainers and losers, as well as what it takes to invest in the ancillary market. Take a, a look at some of the breakdowns in ancillary from technology to devices to finance and beyond. Take a look at all of it. Starting with some of the yesterday's gainers, looking at uh, driven deliveries, they were up 26%. Uh, Hexo was up 40%, but before you get too excited, that's a 14 cent gain. So uh, they're trading at 50 cents. I'm not really sure if that's something to get excited about, but uh, if you're into gambling, since some of the Vegas casinos are closed, this presents a decent opportunity. We'll highlight that Kronos was up $4.19, almost a perfect score. (laughs) Tilray was up 32% to $3.26. Although that's not really a valuation because I'm still kind of opposed to management. I still don't think that there is a captain at the helm of that ship. So we'll see uh, if that just continues to go down after this dead cat bounce. So we've said that there's an inverse relationship with vice stocks being defensive stocks or uh, tobacco, alcohol, and cannabis. And so as soon as all of these margin calls have been met and there's a support level, there's a bottom that's been met, you'll see a V-shaped recovery, whereas everything else will be L-shaped. It'll just be flatlined for a while until some uh, normalcy uh, regains the market and this this fear goes away, that volatility or VIX uh, evaporates. Until then, everything is going to go down. Gold, cannabis, everything is systemic. There is no savior. Everything's going to get annihilated. But eventually, this will have a V-shaped recovery faster, better than uh, any other sector. And so within the cannabis industry, there are some ancillary sectors that we'll, we'll talk about uh, for folks that can't invest directly into cannabis or the, the plant touching, whether they have a, a sin clause uh, or, or otherwise in a pension system, for example. Um, there's just some other opportunities out there for, for everybody to get involved if they so choose. So there's often, you know, the terms retail or institutional to describe the two different types of investors, retail kind of being the mom and pops and institutional being brick and mortars. And then the third accredited investors being, you know, people that are making $250 or more or a million dollars in liquid assets, excluding uh, their permanent residence. So accredited investors can invest in startup companies due to secondary exchanges, which is great in the U.S. uh, for uh, for private companies. Um, in the case of startups, the, the smart money, as it's called, usually comes from venture capitalists who are sophisticated, but certainly not infallible, as we learned from Theranos, uh, WeWork, um, I can name a lot of other companies where there's just a lack of presence. Even though they have maybe a board position or somebody sitting on the board, um, there's still kind of what I've seen from all different varieties of companies, just a lack of accountability. So they'll invest, but there isn't anybody checking uh, the balances. In a lot of cases, there isn't even a CFO. There's no financial analyst of, of any sort. So it's, it's surprising to me that, uh, you know, just look at ease blowing through $166 million uh, trying to do, to create an app and, and still not being a going concern. So there's a lot of uh, a waste and, and misallocation of, of funds out there. Uh, So we usually assume that if a notable venture capitalist makes an investment in a particular startup that was precedented by a whole lot more than just diligence that we could ever hope to accomplish looking in from the outside. So in short, a retail investor can learn a lot by paying attention to a venture capitalist, what they do, what they say. And yet from what I've seen, that's not the case at all. Like I just mentioned, they aren't accountable, holding anybody accountable within the business. Uh, And it's not just plant touching companies. These are e-commerce sites. These are other, you know, ancillary businesses. And so I'm not seeing the due diligence. I'm not seeing the accountability uh, from an investor. And so I I don't believe that, uh, you know, just follow uh, somebody who's successful or famous and, and piggyback on them. Not the case because more than likely they haven't done their due diligence either. So there's a Denver-based venture capital firm, Key Investment Partners. They made a white paper on investing in the ancillary cannabis sector. And so it's chock full of some insights that we're just going to break down from inanalyze.com. So they begin with the history of legalization and moves on to talk about the medical versus recreational. And they've suggested that the medical won't truly reach its potential until cannabis is legal at the federal level. So researchers don't need to ask permission every time they want to research some of the uh, cannabinoids that have therapeutic benefits. But 
they're focusing their investment thesis on a high growth subsector within adult use cannabis while waiting for cannabis to become federal legal, hence the ancillary market. So for the adult use cannabis in 2018, legal cannabis spending in North America was estimated to be around 95% of total global spending. Of that, 56% was recreational. As a whole, cannabis is expected to be experiencing a tremendous growth rate, 20% compounded annual growth for six years with $40.6 billion in consumer spending uh, by 2024, according to BDS Analytics. Who thinks there's a strong likelihood that all U.S. states will have legalized medical marijuana by the end of 2024? So this next section highlights the uniqueness of cannabis investing. The elephant in the room being that cannabis is illegal at the federal level. That's just a risk that's being assumed at this point. So in their white paper, the key talks about the more suitable characteristics of investing in the cannabis sector. The first one relates to estimating the market size for cannabis based on $90 billion black market. They don't think that it's a one-to-one -one translation and that many people out there will still consume cannabis but won't buy it on the black market. And uh, inversely, up in Canada, when you have a 10 milligram limit on edibles, I highly doubt the medical market is going to go there in Washington and other states at 100 milligram limits, you're not seeing medical patients really go to the rec stores because A, it's not enough and B, it's too expensive. So the second characteristic is that capital constraints for cannabis startups. The problem lies in the regulatory risk. So according to an article from CNN Business earlier this year, only about one in 30 banks or credit unions across the U.S. will accept cannabis businesses as customers. So consequently, the cost of capital in cannabis startups is estimated to be between 30 and 40 percent higher than normal. And even when cannabis becomes legal at a federal level, investments will still be restricted by vice clauses, which are rules that restrict some institutional investors from buying stocks in the sinful things like alcohol, tobacco, gambling. So you'll see that a lot in pension funds, for example. So the lack of capital for cannabis startups is actually a blessing in disguise for investors since there's more access to better deals and presumably better terms, specifically in the U.S. where they're privately held companies. So contrast this to popular things like artificial intelligence, which venture capitalists can't get enough of. Uh, key, this group talks about the startups that aren't plant touching businesses, also called ancillary cannabis businesses that are startups with business models that mimic other legitimate companies. Big corporations are already jumping in. As you've heard in 2018, $4 billion was invested in canopy growth by Constellation Brands, the company that owns Modelo and Corona. It was the largest of all time uh, in private U.S. companies. So large corporations have been watching the cannabis sector with a great deal of interest, but are unlikely to begin playing until cannabis becomes legal at the federal level. So it could mean that cannabis startups can operate without competition from large corporations. But when deregulation does occur, you're going to see a lot of exits, uh, assuming people have an exit strategy to get the best uh, return on their investment as possible. So unlike all of the multi-state operators or MSOs, ancillary businesses can conduct business across state lines. So they have lower startup costs and they aren't subjected to certain tax regulations that constrain profits for leaf touching startups, uh, specifically 280E that doesn't prevent, that doesn't allow for uh, businesses to write off uh, employee uh, expenses, for example. So there is a lot of noise. There's a lot of people that are investing in companies because they like to smoke cannabis or it just sounds like a great investment. So there's some exchange traded funds or ETFs out there that are trying to provide a diverse way to invest, uh, but they're just kind of risky. So if you're looking at uh, MJ, the uh, ETF MG Alternative Harvest Index or PodX, you know, those are down a tremendous amount um, year to date. So looking at MJ, they are down almost 45% year to date. Podex is down over 58% year to date. And our AI based cannabis index is up 3.8% year to date. Uh, since August, MJ is down almost 65%. Podex is down over 67%. And we are in the positive by 37%. Now that's nearly a 100% swing. So taking a look at a couple of ancillary sectors, looking at tech and media, looks like today is a nice little bounce with some companies seeing upwards of 33% uh, returns. Looking at the consumption devices sector for another ancillary side, uh, more mild returns. You do see uh, wildflower brands up 20%. The investment and finance sector is also rebounding, although not as fast. You are seeing at 9.45 uh, from AMRS. Looking at the real estate sector, it looks like IIPR is up about 3%. It's only going to take a little bit of uh, 
a reversal in commercial prices for that ETF or for that uh, real estate investment trust or REIT to completely collapse. You're seeing grow capital up 30%, but proprietary and properties, PRRE is down 60% today. So I would look out for that. Diego Pellicer worldwide is down 12%. They sold their Seattle uh, business, the retail shop to Zips, I think. Uh, so they're already trying to exit because their, their uh, business did not work out too well with uh, a high-end market and a commodity base kind of uh, didn't work out for them. A little bit of a dichotomy there. Looking at the secondary service sector, that's fairly down today. Kushko Holdings is up 15.6% uh, trying to sell some local bottles. I think they still get their stuff from China, but if they can get uh, manufacturing in the U.S., that'll definitely help. Looking at the biotech, looking at the biotech sector, uh, that across the board that is up. So Cara is up twelve percent. Uh, that's within our own uh, cannabis index. Canna Life is up nine percent, looking good there. The hemp product sector also up nine uh, percent for Charlotte's Web, nine percent for uh, another one of Charlotte's Web, Canada and the U.S. Marijuana product sector, Cresco Labs up eight and a half percent. Neptune Wellness up fourteen percent. Better Choice up 32%. High Tides down 33%. The ag tech sector, a uh, little mixed here. Smart Cannabis Corp down 14%. Future Pharma down 20%. Uh, Micron Waste Technologies, I mean, that's a, a three cents. So <laughs> that doesn't even count what they're doing. And then looking at cultivation and retail, this is plant touching. A little mixed uh, there. You know, see Canopy is up 13 percent green thumbs is down 23 aurora is up 10 this is all pretty much a dead cat bounce till raise up 32 uh probably expect those to all drop tomorrow um, great opportunity for trading as uh, companies go up and down you can look at these individually every day and start to see a pattern during volatile times uh, which is how we're able to kind of uh, take advantage of, of some of these dips as soon as they come down. Our AI-based uh, trading robot will pick them up uh, at a deal and um, we tend to not lose money as much as the competitors have you seen. We aren't losing nearly as much as the, the competitors. So uh, almost about a 100% swing uh, from August. So there are some opportunities out there, but it's also a bloodbath. There's a lot of volatility. So even with a dead cat bounce today, probably will drop tomorrow but you got to wait and find out so with that we're going to roll this one up i'm josh kincaid this is the talking hedge don't forget to like share and subscribe or don't and i'm out